DiscerningHearts.com presents Communion with Christ, Practical Prayer with Deacon James Keating. Deacon Keating is a professor of spiritual theology at Kenrick Lennon Seminary in St. Louis, Missouri. He has formerly served as the Director of Theological Formation at the Institute for Priestly Formation. He is the author of numerous books, including Heart of the Diaconate, Remain in Me, Spousal Prayer, and Listening for Truth. He has given more than 400 workshops on moral theology and spirituality and regularly conducts retreats. Communion with Christ, Practical Prayer with Deacon James Keating. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We are exploring the Church's teaching on Christian prayer found in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and we've been focusing on the beautiful reflection that is found in paragraph 2605, which takes us to the heart of Jesus' last words on the cross. One of the most compelling moments there, if you can single out any, is a moment where a grieving mother is at the foot of the cross, watching her son suffer so, and he turns to her and those around and gives her to another. The the famous words, woman, behold your son, and behold your mother, he says to John. And this giving over of uh, the mother uh, to the church, and the church receiving the mothering of Mary herself. And what's so beautiful about this is that he gives Mary to the church as mother, and she was the one who taught Jesus how to pray. And, of course, we have no idea of the intimacies between Mary and God, Mary and her spouse, the Holy Spirit. But all we can imagine would be that what she taught Jesus as a child or how to pray, to learn, how to attend to interiority, she now wants to give to the whole church. She is the wellspring of interiority because she held all these things in her heart. She held all the great mysteries of the Paschal mystery in her heart. She was silently overwhelmed by what had happened to her. The Holy Spirit came upon her She was impregnated with life itself. Life itself took up residence in her. She gave birth to life itself. She saw life itself be rejected. Love itself be rejected. Holiness itself be rejected. She saw that which she bore in her body be rejected. She saw that which she said yes to. She saw that being said no to by everyone. She had the courage to say yes to life and love, and then the rest of the world said no to life and love. So all of these things she held in her heart, and now she is bestowed by Jesus himself at the very moment of his ultimate self-giving. Again, here's Jesus thinking of his bride, the church. He's not thinking of himself. That alone silences us. And he gives to the bride his mother, the one who gave life to him in the flesh. And what he's bestowing on the bride is all the wisdom of the mother. Bestowing on the bride all the wisdom gleaned from Mary's own life of prayer, for she truly had become prayer. And of course the church accepts Mary And the beautiful words that Jesus uses from the cross, Behold your mother. Notice that she becomes an icon in that sentence. You behold an icon. The icon is the doorway to prayer. It's the doorway to heaven. Behold her. Hold her in your being. Hold her and her life of interiority in your being. Hold her, yes, in your being because she's taught the whole church how to receive Pentecost she's taught the whole church 
how to become impregnated with the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Behold your mother, hold her in your being, go to her, and in going to her, she will give you myself. She will give you what she gave to the world, her yes. She will give you me. Because Jesus never takes the church from the Son. Excuse me, Mary never takes the church from the Son. Mary always leads the church into the Son. Into the mystery of Jesus. So this word from the cross actually unveils for the church the greatest of prayers, the woman. Mary. This word from the cross reveals to the church who the model of prayer is. Go to her. I thirst. And again, the, 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 the whole consciousness of Christ is just caught up into these two words. I thirst. This is why he wants to respond to our prayer so deeply. This is why he so generously said to the good thief, you'll be with me because I have been thirsting for you since the beginning of time. I've been thirsting for you. God has been thirsting for his bride since the beginning of time. In God was all creation since the beginning of time. And God wanted union with that. God wanted union with all all the goodness all the goodness of the creation that he imagined and willed and sustains. And of course, because of evil, because of our abuse of freedom, he lost the bride. The bride was hiding. The bride hid from God. The bride hid from God in sin. And God came looking for the bride in flesh in Jesus of Nazareth with a thirst that is eternal. This is God's fidelity. No matter how often we turn from God, God never turns from us. He has an eternal thirst for union with the bride, and he will find us. Even if it kills him, he will find us. And it did kill him. I thirst for you, That is the divine side of prayer. The divine side of prayer is God's everlasting longing for us. When he shares the grace of that longing, he inspires our thirst for God. There's a mutual thirsting, a mutual desiring, a mutual longing going on. And for those who truly become prayers like Mary, their whole life is defined by this thirst for God. That's why prayer never becomes or no longer is understood as an interruption of the day, as something that has to be done, as an obligation. Prayer becomes my breath. Prayer becomes who I am. Because something of the thirst for God, for His creation, Something of the power of that thirst has entered me by way of grace. And now I thirst for the source of creation. It's who I become. It's who I am. I run to God like fiancés run to one another. Not out of obligation, but out of longing. Prayer becomes the blessing of my day, not the obstacle to my work. Prayer becomes who I have become. I thirst for God. My whole being thirsts for God. I cannot be quenched by the passing age, by its values, by its distractions, by its meanings. None of these can quench me once I become a man of prayer. I am restless, and only one fountain 
can stop the thirst, and that is absolute and deep communion with the God who lives within me. This is the one who stops my this is the one who quenches my thirst, who stops my thirst, and him alone. So God is longing for us, and then he gifts us with a longing for God. And if we're caught up in that, we're caught up in the joy of the Holy Spirit, who always prays within us. We have to be caught up in the joy of the Holy Spirit to be good prayers, because we receive the joy from allowing God to pray in us, in His Spirit. That's why we have to beg God for the Spirit so that God will do our praying for us and we will know the freedom of having our thirst quenched by God himself. Come Holy Spirit. Help us to understand this next phrase for this seems to be the prayer that or the the crying out that for so many of us is the one that it seems as though it would come from us and not from Jesus. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right, and just how beautifully you just said that, it seems like it comes from us and not from Jesus. And yes, it comes from us. This is our prayer. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is the human prayer. It's, of course, a backwards prayer. We have forsaken God. God has never forsaken us. But in our dereliction due to sin, Due to finitude, limit, ignorance, stupidity, we've screwed up our lives so much that we think that God, God has hurt us in some way. And so this is our prayer. This is that God, in absolute solidarity with our brokenness, God, where are you? Of course, God is always with us, in us, and for us. But because of our choices to live in the dark through sin, through rationalization, We think God has left. And Jesus, of course, is taken up into this darkness on the cross because he took upon us all our sins. He took upon himself all of our sins. This is how a sinner prays. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And God's response, of course, is resurrection. No, I haven't forsaken you. You're in darkness, you're shrouded in loneliness because of your choices. But ever so slowly, ever so gently, I keep nudging my way into your isolation. I keep pushing my way in. Will you respond? Will you let me raise you from your sin? Will you let me affect you? Will you let me reach you? I only want to reach you with transformation and resurrection. It is not I who have forsaken you, but you have forsaken me. And it feels like I'm far, but in your sin, I am so close to you. It feels like I'm far because you have hidden your face from me. But I have come to seek out the lost. I have come not for the righteous, but for the sinner. Forsake me no longer. Let me find you. And then there upon the cross, Jesus hanging in sin, we find ourselves. That's who we are. We are lost, alone, hanging from a cross of our own choosing. Jesus, save me. The centurion, truly this is the Son of God. This is our Savior. He walked our way. He went before us. He reveals our pathetic loneliness in this tree of death. Truly this is God, God who loves, so as to enter our forsakenness. 
and from this consciousness arises the beauty of the prayer, which to some extent mirrors the prayer of the thief, the good thief. I know I am lost. Please find me now. And of course, this is the whole conspiracy of God, is to show us who we really are, what sin really looks like. Sin really looks like crucifixion. It really looks like abandonment. To show us who we really are, so that we can cry out for what we have rejected. And what we have rejected, of course, is life and life to the full. Sin and our choices to sin always decimate life and life to the full. And God always wants to bring life and life to the full to us. So this is our prayer. This is who we are. We are blaming God. We think God has left us. But no, we, we have left God. And then in those last words that he gives us, it is about divine trust, isn't it? Jesus cries out that it's finished, it's completed, it's come to fulfillment. What has come to fulfillment? The reaching out of God toward his creation and the hope of God that creation in the power of God will now respond. In other words, the prayer has finished. The liturgy is over. God has found his people by way of Jesus. The disciples and others and those who they will preach the good news to have responded to this initiation of the liturgy of God. And now it's complete. And this liturgy will never end, of course, because it's taken up into the the Mass. And so the doors to salvation are now always open. The life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus are always generously available to all humanity by way of the genius of God, by leaving bread and wine become blood and body at the hands of the priest. In the simplicity of that, bread, wine, priest, the doors of this great mystery of God reaching out to us and us hopefully responding, this prayer of God crying out and we echoing a response, this choir of God seeking and we saying amen will go on forever now by way of the church's liturgy, by way of the Eucharist. So it is finished, meaning that it is so full, the mystery of God seeking humanity is so full, that it can never be contained in just a temporal moment upon the cross. It just spills out down through the corridors of all time, of all ages, so that all human beings can be completed, can be finished, can be brought into fulfillment, if only they would say, the body of Christ, amen. If only they would behold the body of Christ, amen. The mystery of Christ on the cross, amen. And enter that mystery. Enter that mystery in trust that even death cannot separate us from God, that even sin is not the last word, but God will even enter our sin and find us so that he can complete his mission of love. So it is finished? Yes, there's no other Savior but Jesus Christ. But the offer of salvation goes on forever in the official prayer of the church. Father, into your hands I commit, commit my spirit. And of course now Jesus dies completely here. And the providence of God 
then shines forth from this incredible trust of Christ. The providence of God now takes center stage. What will the Father do with such a son? What will the Father do with such obedience? What will the Father do as a result of this Son always listening to Him, always being in communion with Him? And there is this great silent pause in time. And we wonder now, this man who was prayer and said he was prayer, said he was always in union with the Father. What will become of such a man? Were we fools in following him into prayer? Will we be disappointed with prayer? What will become of such a man? And of course, we know that the Father is faithful. And the Father is faithful in the light of such an incredible generosity of the Son. And the Father will not let the Son be defined by death. This is what's at stake in Christianity. The Father will not let the Son be defined by death. Oh, Jesus, yes. He was the one who said the kingdom would come in him, but death overtook him. Jesus, oh yes, he's the dead one. He's just the dead one. No, he is the living one by the providence of the Spirit as the Father raised him from the dead, entered into death itself. Love enters into death itself and conquers death, making death no longer the last word, but simply a transition, simply a nod to our nature of finitude and limit. But death is not the last word, for love itself has entered into death, and out of death and from death life springs by the power of the Father's voice. Which we could say we already heard the first echo of in the prayer of Jesus when he said, Lazarus, come forth. He was already preparing the world for the word of the Father to enter into his own corpse and raise him. Not in the way that Lazarus is raised to die again, but to never die again. And for us to clamor to attach our lives to this mystery of resurrection so that we too can rise with him. And that all of our prayers then become this hope of the resurrection, this hope of never leaving or losing communion with God, or hope that our prayers will sustain us in and through death, our communion with God will sustain us in and through death. I will go into death in communion with God because I have had his prayer in me. I have had his Holy Spirit praying in me. And this spirit is a spirit of life and not a spirit of death. And so my prayer life becomes a hope that nobody can touch me. Death itself can't touch me, for I am Jesus's. I am the Christ's. I'm God's. And God is a God of the living, not of the dead. Into your hands we commend our spirits. After a lifetime of prayer, we commend our spirits into the providential hand of the Father by way of Jesus Christ in his Holy Spirit, and death will not touch any one of us. Is there a significance in that loud cry, that the undescribed word, the, the sound that emanates from Christ at that very last moment? I think the significance of the loud cry, of course, is all of creation groaning in the Pauline sense, that all of creation groans, all of creation cries out. From the very beginning of creation, creation has longed to return to the Father, and now creation is returning to the Father in Jesus. 
Creation itself has reached its apex in Jesus. And creation itself then cries out. Cries out for that deep communion with the Source, with the Father, to return to the Source. In the medieval mystics, they had a sense of everything coming from God and everything returning to God. Everything flowed from God, and in God everything flows back to God. And this cry of Jesus is to some extent the break of creation, the total breakdown of sin. Now there's a crack in creation. There's a passageway in creation that we can all go through to get back to our rightful, our rightful disposition as ones who receive the love of God in freedom. And that crack and that crevice and that opening is the death of Jesus. We go through the death of Jesus and we receive what we, our hearts have always desired in prayer, to be one with God. So it's a loud cry that cracks open creation and we crawl through this crevice attaching ourselves to the death of Jesus, and Jesus himself brings us to the Father. That's all the time we have for today on this Reflection on Prayer. I'm hoping, Deacon Keating, you could help us in closing with prayer today. Lord Jesus Christ, we ask for a deeper spirit of prayer. We ask for a deeper attention to your interior movements. We ask for the wisdom to discern the voices within our hearts to follow that voice which is only yours, and to jettison all voices that keep us bound to dead and dying things. Amen. Amen. You've been listening to Communion with Christ, Practical Prayer, with Deacon James Keating. To hear and or to download this episode, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com or you can find it within the free Discerning Hearts app. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation which is fully tax deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us next time for Communion with Christ, Practical Prayer, with Deacon James Keating.